open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Continuing to um, talk about rediscover church, talking about the things, what the church is and what the church does. Um, you may notice that as we work through, if you're reading the book, as we work through the book, I'm not going in order as far as chapters go and on what chapters we, on what sermons the chapters go along with. We did one and two this morning. We're doing four tonight. The primary reason for that is that I had to pick what are the best topics that are going to appeal to a bigger audience on Sunday morning and which ones are going to be better for, you know, family dinner table at night um, when it's the, the, the slim few of us. Um, and so I kind of arranged them in that matter. Um, and so tonight we talk about preaching, why the church does preaching, why, why every week do I or somebody else stand at this pulpit and just talk for like 30 minutes nonstop, um, because there's really not many other careers that do this sort of thing that I'm doing right now. Uh, politicians do it and comedians do it, and that's about it, um, other than, other than um, preachers. And so I see preaching of the Bible as arguably the most important thing we do as a church, I take this task that I do very seriously. This is not a time for me to take lightly what I'm doing right now. It's not a time for me to make the sermon all about telling stories about myself, although personal examples are helpful. It's not a time for me to make a statement about something in the news, though the Bible speaks to what's going on in the world, and I will address that at times. It's not a time for me to do stand a stand-up comedy act, although humor can be helpful at times. In this moment, when I preach... I'm to herald the words of King Jesus, proclaiming his message to his people. That's what I'm to do. Uh, a herald, if you um, know how it worked, a herald would take a message from the king and go out into the city and announce it to the people. That's what the job of a preacher is, is to take the message God has given his people and go announce it to them. So talking about preaching tonight, this is a time for you to hear and understand what exactly I am to do as a preacher or whoever else is in this pulpit. Um, it'll help you understand its importance, why we do it, uh, why it's not something I should half do, and why it's not something I should skip, and also why it's important for the life of the church. If you have weak preaching, you'll often have a weak church because often the pulpit is the, is the captain's wheel that drives the church. And so 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 16. We're going to read through chapter 4, verse 5. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, Endure suffering, do the work of an, of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. <coughs> uh, Second Timothy is probably the last letter Paul wrote, um, and, and this is his final instructions to his uh, practically the, mo the closest man on earth he was, um, he, he was with, uh, the man that he taught everything he knew. And this is what he's telling him in the last words he'll ever write to him. He's telling him, preach the word. Um, Paul was probably killed somewhere at, or shortly after writing 2 Timothy. We know from the time that it was probably dated. Um, so, so he's thinking, what's the last thing I can tell my, my, my apprentice Timothy before I'm taken out of this world? I'll tell him, trust scripture and preach the word. I'm, uh, I'm to preach God's word. I'm not to preach my ideas. I'm not to preach my thoughts. I'm to preach God's word. I'm to read it explain it, and apply it. I saw a joke the other day that um, uh, they, they said that that pastor had one of those Chick-fil-A Bibles. They're closed on Sundays. Because if a preacher 
preaches and never opens his Bible, he's not preaching. I want my sermon to always be tied to the Bible. If I'm not constantly um, referring back to the text I'm preaching, uh, I'm not preaching. Paul says, if you notice verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. Let's just work through these verses. All scripture is breathed out by God. That is Genesis through Revelation. Now, when Paul wrote this, the New Testament wasn't completely formed together yet, but, but through the Spirit and through the um, hands of the apostles, he inspired the New Testament to be written. The books of Scripture that we have are Genesis through Revelation, um, the 66 books in our Bible. Um, that there's, there's some translations of the Bible that have more books in them, specifically the um, Catholic Bible. Um, we don't consider those extra books um, inspired by God. They may be helpful for understanding the time period that the Bible was written in, but they're not inspired. Genesis through Revelation. We don't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we like. We, we, we don't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we like. I don't pick and choose what parts I preach. I must preach it all. And that's my goal over the course of my life, to um, have preached the majority of the Bible by the time I'm done with ministry. This is why I preach through books of the Bible. Uh, if I didn't preach through books of the Bible, starting at chapter 1 and preaching to the end, that's how I do the majority of the time. Obviously, January, I'm not doing that. But um, if I didn't do that, I promise you, I would end up preaching the same sermon about you know, every 10 weeks. Just be like a 10-week rotation of the same sermons. I must preach the narratives of Genesis. I must preach the prophecy of Isaiah. I must preach the poetry of the Psalms. I must preach the letters of Paul, the revelation of John, and more. I must not shy away from it, from any of it, because it's too hard. Someday, I'm going to preach the book of Proverbs. I have no idea how I'm going to do it. Because if you know Proverbs, it's not like I can take huge chunks and preach this you know, paragraph together because it's literally one statement after another. I, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'm going to someday. Because all scripture is breathed out by God, even ones that are hard to preach. It's important we keep all scripture in mind, otherwise we end up saying some dumb things. Uh, for example, what some people might say is, Jesus never said anything about that issue. Whatever the issue may be. That's often used for the issue of homosexuality. Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Uh, and what they mean by that is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. And there's two problems with that issue or any or using that for Jesus in any case. Um, there's two things that are wrong about that. First of all, the Gospels don't record every single word Jesus ever spoke. Therefore, you don't know if he said anything about it or not. But secondly... Jesus is part of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Godhead wrote Genesis through Revelation. The, the words of Genesis through Revelation are the words of Jesus, not just the words and the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if Genesis through Revelation says something about an issue, Jesus did say something about it. It's there. It says a few things about Scripture. First of all, um, in verse 16, um, scripture is inspired. It is breathed out by God, inspired. Simply put, when I speak, I have to breathe out to do it. When I, when I say a word into this microphone, I'm breathing out to do it. God spoke to the writers of scripture, and they wrote, the, they, they wrote what he said. It's not how we might imagine it, um, uh, the, the way I used to picture how God inspired the scriptures was something like in a sci-fi movie, you know, where John was, you know, sitting in his, John or Matthew or whoever was sitting in his, you know, bedroom one day, and he was just like possessed by an essence, and his hand grabbed a pen and just started scribbling out. That, that's not how scripture was written. No, literally just John or Paul or whoever wrote a letter, and the Holy Spirit moved in them as they wrote it. Many, it, it was a normal process, but the Spirit moved to inspire the work. Many of the letters in the New Testament are written to specific issues going on in specific churches. So 1 Corinthians is written to address a lot of problems in that church. They've got all kinds of issues. Paul is addressing every single one of them, and the Holy Spirit is working through him to say these things. Philippians is written to thank the church at Philippi for a gift they sent to Paul, and the Holy Spirit is moving in him to write that letter. 1 John is written to counter false teaching, and the Holy Spirit is moving in John to write a normal letter to this church. 
in God's sovereignty, he guided all that the writers wrote through his divine breath. Scripture is inspired. Also, Scripture is without error, verse 16. It is without error because it's breathed out by God. We're still focusing on that breathed out by God aspect. It is without error. It's inspired. It's without error. Because God breathed the scriptures, they are without error because he is without error. They don't have to be updated to fit the culture. They don't have to be modified. They don't have to be updated. This doesn't mean we don't produce new translations of it. That's not what this means. Um, Sometimes people will tell me, um, if it's not the 1611 King James Version, I'm not reading it. And I tell them every single time, you don't have a 1611 King James Version. You have an updated King James Version because the 1611 King James Version is written in Old English and you wouldn't be able to understand it. It's been updated because language evolves over time. Words today aren't spelled the same way they were 400 years ago. Words today don't mean the exact same thing that they did 400 years ago. Language evolves. So new translations are not updating the Bible. It's just making it more accessible to people to understand it. We don't have to update the teaching of the Bible. Now, if there's a translation that updates teaching and changes stuff, yeah, avoid that. But but a lot of the good translations that we have do not do that. We don't have to update the teaching of the Bible. When culture says the Bible is outdated on things like marriage or the role of women or any such thing like that, we say it is without error. It does not need to be updated. It doesn't. It is authoritative. Because Scripture is breathed out by God and without error, it is authoritative. It has authority. So when I stand here and preach on Sunday, I'm doing so with authority, but it's not my authority. I've got no authority. Uh, uh, I have no authority in myself just because I'm a pastor. If you're friends with me on Facebook, you know I like to rank stuff. It's one of my hobbies. I love, I love to do it. I've ranked Chick-fil-A sauces. I've ranked the Spider-Man movies. I, you know, I list my top 10 books every year uh, th- that I read. Um, but, but understand, I've got no authority to say what the best Chick-fil-A sauce is. I've got no authority to say what the best Spider-Man movie is. I, I just don't have that authority. I have my likes and my preferences. I have no authority on COVID. I have no authority on politics. I have no authority on anything. It is the word that has authority. The scripture is what has authority. I'm simply the messenger that announces it. I'm bringing the message of the king to people. If they have a problem with the word, they have a problem with the king more than they have a problem with with me. I must not apologize for what the word says because it's authoritative. Charles Spurgeon is attributed to saying something like, the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Just let it out of the cage and let it roar. That's all you have to do. My job is not to entertain or to please people. It's to shine a light on God's word and let it speak for what it says. Let it roar like a lion. Paul then lists several other things that it is. It's profitable. It is profitable. Verse 16, we're still there. It is profitable for four things. Technically two, but but it lists four. It's profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. I would, I would probably clump teaching and reproof together and correction and training for righteousness together. Um, teaching and reproof is teaching the correct doctrines, the correct things for you to believe, and reproving false ideas. So teaching truth and reproving falsehood. That, that's the same thing. It's just opposite sides of the same coin. And correcting Correction and training in righteousness are kind of the two sides of the same coin. Just simply correcting you where you're off track and training you to walk correctly. So there's a doctrinal aspect to it and there's a life aspect to it. It's, it's um, teaching you the right ideas and reproving the wrong ideas. And it's correcting you where you're off track in life and teaching you where to walk correctly. The Bible's primary purpose is not inspiration. It's not inspiration. The Bible's primary purpose is instruction, instruction. Of course it inspires us, and of course it makes us feel good, but the the Bible's primary purpose is not to make you feel good. It's to instruct you. It's to give you life. The Bible is not candy. It's not just meant to be eaten and have a sweet taste in your mouth, and then it just goes out of, of existence. No, it's daily bread. 
It is meant to keep you alive. It's meant to instruct you in truth, correct you in your failings, and form you more and more into the image of Jesus. Most um, don't settle for just reading, you know, a verse of the day on your Bible app or just reading a daily devotional or, or whatever. You need the word. Read those things absolutely, but not in replacement of reading the word. And finally, God's word equips it is profitable for those four things, and it equips. It, the, you need God's word. You need his actual word. Absolutely read, by, read books that help explain the word to you. I do it all the time, but no, don't neglect the word in that. The word completes and equips you. That's what it says, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete and equipped. It provides all that you need to live the Christian life faithfully. It has everything you need. It, it, it grows you more and more into maturity in Christ. You need this word. You need to study this word on your own. You need, to, um, you need to intake it on your own by yourself. You need to hear it preached from the pulpit. You need to study it in a smaller group. Often that is in Sunday school. Maybe it's in a Bible study at work or, or in your neighborhood or something like that. And you need that daily time where you do it uh, alone by yourself. You need the word to equip you and make you complete in Christ. That's why so many Christians in America are so weak. They don't take the word in. They're starving to death spiritually. There's no meat on their bones. And this is why preaching is so important. And so we've looked at verse 16 and 17, the word. Now we move to the preaching of the word. Verses um, 1 through 4 of chapter 4. Paul tells many ways that, that, that Timothy is to preach the word and that I'm to preach the word and that any preacher is to preach the word. First of all, he's to preach the word faithfully, to preach the word faithfully. In light of Jesus, I'm to constantly bear three things in mind while I preach. And he says it there in verse 1. First of all, I'm to bear in mind that Jesus is the judge. He's the judge. I will be judged for my preaching one of the verses in the Bible that causes me to fear and tremble is James 3, 1, that says that not many people should teach because they'll be held to um, harsher judgment than, than the rest of them. Uh, I should bear in mind Jesus is judge, so, so preach faithfully. Secondly, Jesus is coming. He, he's coming again. So that, that's by his appearing. So preach faithfully because Jesus is coming again. He could come tomorrow. I should preach every sermon as though it's the last sermon I will ever preach. Because I don't know that it isn't. I don't know that, I, that, that Jesus won't come back before Wednesday when I do prayer meeting. And I don't know that I won't be dead before Wednesday when prayer meeting happens. I may die or Jesus may come before Wednesday. So I must strive to be 100% in every sermon. I'm not going to preach the greatest sermon every week. I'm just not. Every time I write a sermon, I, I pray this prayer. Lord, help me to write a good sermon and then let the Spirit take it and make it a great sermon. And thirdly, I should preach faithfully in light of the fact that Jesus is judge, that Jesus is coming, and then that the kingdom is here. The kingdom of God is here. It's that um, understanding in Scripture that when Jesus came the first time, he started the kingdom of God, but it's not finished yet. It's going to be finished when he comes again. So he's, inaug he's brought the kingdom into place, but it's not completely here yet. It's kind of like that time when um, the president is elected in November, but he's not officially the president until January. That's kind of the period that we're in as far as the kingdom of God goes. The, the person's in charge, but they're not in charge in, in the same way that they're going to be one day yet. I am a herald of that kingdom. I don't just do a normal job when I'm up here. It's a very serious task. I can't phone this in every week. This is work for the kingdom of heaven. This is a serious work. And Paul charges Timothy very seriously. Preaching is not something we can just give or take. It is the most important thing we do in our worship service, and I would argue all the time. So I'm to preach the word faithfully. Secondly, verse 2, I'm to preach the word. Preach the word. I'm to preach the word. I'm not to preach somebody else's sermons. When Fred Evers was still alive, pastor of Northside, um, he kind of mentored me for a little bit. So I was in his office one day, and he told me, um, 
I got a phone call one day from some pastor in somewhere else in Georgia. And what Northside had um, recently just been doing their, their services on the radio, but they had started broadcasting them on TV. I don't think they still do that, but, but they did at that time. And they started broadcasting them on TV to where there was some way where it was on radio. Um, oh, oh, he, he, only, he knew like the secret of how to listen to it, but most people didn't. Whereas, you know, wherever he was at in Georgia... But um, when, when he started broadcasting it on TV, anybody in Georgia could see it. And so Fred Evers got a call one day from some pastor that said, why did you all start broadcasting your sermons on TV? And Fred said, what are you talking about? He said, now I got to find somebody else to preach their sermons. I got to find another preacher to get my sermons from. Because my church can go watch it and see that I copied you. There's been a lot in the news lately. Um, the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention got into trouble last year because he preached the exact same sermon of the former Southern Baptist president dealing with Romans 1, the, the chapter. He gave the same bullet points and everything, got, got in a lot of trouble for it. I'm to do my own work as a pastor. I mean, certainly I'm to bring in books and research and help you know, form my sermon, but, but um, um, I, I, you deserve nothing less than for me to deeply study God's word and preach to you out of the overflow of that, not just you know ripping off somebody else's sermon. Me preaching someone else's sermon, excuse the graphic nature of this, but it's the equivalent of me eating, regurgitating, and feeding that to Haddon. That's the equivalent. I'm not. I'm to preach the word. I'm not to preach news or pop culture. It's pretty common for um, hip churches. I don't hate hip churches, but, but they tend to do this sometimes. They'll do a series called At the Movies. At the Movies, they will show a clip from a movie. I don't know, maybe it's, you know, uh, Forrest Gump, or maybe it's Star Wars, or maybe it's, you know, Saving Private Ryan. I don't know. They'll show a clip from a movie, and then that will be the springboard for the whole sermon. They'll show how, well, look how this guy saves Private Ryan, and, and this is compared to how Jesus saved us. And let me just elaborate on that for a little bit. And they'll never open the Bible. They'll preach the movie. I'm to preach the word. I'm not to preach a movie. I'm not against movies. I love movies. But that's not what I preach. I'm to preach the word always. That's the second part of verse 2. Be ready in season and out of season. I'm to preach always. Preach the word always. When the church is growing, I'm to preach the word. When uh, church attendance is fading and you're tempted to do something else flashy to draw some people in, I'm to preach the word. When I don't feel like um, getting out of bed on a Sunday morning, I'm to preach the word. When the text I'm preaching is really difficult to understand, I'm to preach the word. When, uh, the, when, when the church is in the midst of a disagreement, I'm to preach the word. When church giving is down, I'm to preach the word. When people in the church have died recently, I'm to preach the word. If somebody shows up at church that Sunday who you know might get offended by, by, by the sermon, I'm to preach the word. My mantra as a pastor, what I constantly remind myself is this. If you preach it, they will come. If you preach it, they will come. I don't have any tricks up my sleeves on how to um, attract people to church. I, I just don't have it. I firmly believe if I preach the word faithfully, the people who are hungry for that will come. They will come. Next. Last part of, well, not the last part. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. I'm to preach the word with the heart of a pastor. Um, that those are pastoral words, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Sometimes I'll hear people say this phrase, that guy, that guy's a preacher, but he's not a pastor. And, and I get what they're saying by that, that, they don't, that, that, that person doesn't shepherd the way they should. And so they, they don't show up to the hospital, they don't visit at homes, they, they don't do that kind of stuff. Pastors who aren't among their people like that need to repent. A shepherd should smell like sheep. But just understand that my job of preaching is very much part of being a shepherd. This isn't separate from my pastoral job. I don't preach to a faceless crowd on Sundays. I don't preach to people I don't know. I preach to a group of people whom I know and love. I know your stories. 
I know your joys. I know your struggles. I love you deeply. So when I preach, I'm preaching in light of that. When I plan what I'm going to preach, I do so through the help of the Spirit, and sometimes he surprises me in the process. Um, many of you know I plan out, uh, I sat down in July or August of a year, and I kind of seek the Lord of where he's leading me to preach most of the following year. A lot of times that changes. Um, some people think that, um, that that sort of planning that far out isn't listening to the Spirit, but I would argue the Spirit is as capable of, of helping me know what I'm going to preach the whole year as he is, like Saturday night, helping me figure out what I'm supposed to preach the next day. Um, the, the Holy Spirit's capable of helping me with that. And so many times, you know, doing that since I've been here, so many times I've planned out the whole year, you know, in August of 2019 or whenever, and the following year in like September, a sermon I had on the calendar for a year, I preach, and it just hits a person right at the moment that they are needing it, and they tell me that at the door, and I'm like, that's because the Holy Spirit knew a year ago that you were going to need that sermon, and so he had me plan that on the calendar and write that. The Holy Spirit knows all things, and he knows what we need. So Paul tells Timothy, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Have the heart of a pastor when you preach. I know the struggles you're facing. I know the joys and sorrows. I know the sins that we might be tempted with. As a shepherd knows his sheep, so a shepherd can reprove, rebuke, and exhort. I can't do that to an audience I don't know any specific thing about. Reprove simply means to reprimand, to take an idea captive. So if an idea is starting to sway the church, I'm going to grab a hold of it and say, no, no. Rebuke is to disapprove of something for correction. Similar idea. Exhort is to strongly urge in a particular direction. Essentially, my job as a shepherd preacher is to constantly urge you, go this way, don't go this way. Go this way, don't go this way. Like a shepherd and his sheep. Go this way. Stay on the path. Don't walk off that cliff over there. Come on, let's go. Let's go this way. My preaching and my shepherding are not separate callings. My preaching is part of my shepherding, and my preaching grows out of my shepherding. Next, this is finally the last part of verse 2. Preach the word with patience. With patience. This is important because anyone who teaches something wants the learner to grasp it. Any of you who are educators, you know that. You, you teach this stuff and you want your students to get it, and they don't get it. That's why you got to teach the same thing next year. But with preaching, that, as with anything, that can take time. So what will often be my desire to think is that I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to preach a really banger sermon one Sunday, and the church is going to immediately be changed and never be confused on a topic ever again and walk in perfect obedience to Jesus and understand that for the rest of their life. And that's not how it works. No, actually, it takes preaching that same topic over years for the church to finally grasp it. It takes just as long, it takes us a long time to finally grasp something deep down in ourselves. And so I must preach with patience and wait for the Holy Spirit to work in you and in me. Finally, verses 3 and 4. We, spent, we, we hit five points in verse 2. We're going to hit one point in verse 3 and 4. I must preach the word to counter false teaching, to counter false teaching. He says there's coming a time when people won't listen to sound teaching. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They'll, they'll stop listening to truth. They'll pull in preachers who are going to preach to them, and they're going to love the preaching, but it's going to be a bunch of hogwash. That, that has been the story of the last 2,000 years. That, that's, that was the story of the days of John <clears throat> that was the stories of the, of the day of Martin Luther. That's the story of today. People love false teachers. They'll share their clips on Facebook and say, listen to how good this is. And I'll listen to it, and I'm like, he just like, misinterpreted about five Bible passages when he said that. I mean, he did it with energy, but he's wrong. There is false teaching everywhere in our culture. Everywhere from you can be whatever gender you want to be, down to God's main purpose for you is to be happy. And my job as a preacher is to be countering false teaching like that. He, he says, because there's coming a time when people will stop listening to good preaching, and they'll turn, not, not to, no, he doesn't just call it bad preaching, what's he call it? It's myths. Myths. 
They'll wander into myths that will suit their own passions. They will want to live lives for themselves, so they will accumulate preachers who don't preach truth and will tickle their ears. So they can have the appearance of being faithful church people, yet live completely outside of God's will and never be challenged on it. When that time comes, Paul says, preach the word. Continue preaching the word when the world stops listening to it. Continue preaching the sound doctrine when the world doesn't want sound doctrine. Continue preaching hard truth when people call you a bigot for it. Continue preaching Christ when people say you're unloving for it. Preach the word. So we've seen the word, verses 16 through 17. We've seen the preaching of the word, verses 1 through 4. Now verse 5, the preacher. The preacher. In light of this task, Paul gives the preacher, Timothy, me, any person who stands in this pulpit, any person who has preached in history, he gives, them, he gives a word to them. He calls the preacher to four things. Perhaps this is where you come in. A lot of this sermon has um, been preaching, you to in, <coughs> preaching to you to instruct you on, on what I'm supposed to do. But maybe this is where you come in. Would you commit to regularly pray verse 5 for me? Those four things that it says to do. Be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Pray for me to regularly exercise those four things. I'm going to explain what they are in just right, right now, but, but pray for those, pray those four things for me. First of all, the preacher must be sober-minded. I would, I would sum that up as the preacher must, uh, sober-minded simply means clear-headed, clear-headed. So the preacher must take care of himself. I must take care of myself. Help me with that. I must, have a, I must take care of myself spiritually. I must have a devotional life separate from my sermon prep. I must have a vibrant walk with Jesus. I must regularly get away and pray. I must regularly sing. I must treasure God's word. I must delight in Jesus above everything else. I must be regularly confessing my sins and turning from them. Uh, one way that I do this is once a month, I meet with a pastor that I'm friends with over in Douglas, and we read a book together, and then we just have an accountability time where we confess our sins to each other in areas that we're struggling in our life. We do that um, about every month. We don't hit every single month, but, but, but we aim to do that once a month. My preaching will be best when I have a healthy relationship with Jesus personally. I must take care of myself physically. It is difficult as a pastor to stay healthy. It's why so many pastors are 300 pounds. We do a lot of sitting. We do a lot of driving. We have a lot to do, so often we eat unhealthy on the go. Pastoring can be stressful, which doesn't add to helping with exercise or sleep. I must exercise and eat well. I made a new commitment to that at the start of the year. Um, I had fallen off a little bit November, December, um, uh, I was exercising none, and I was pretty much eating garbage. And so at the start of the new year, I kick-started it back, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back on the healthy train uh, because I will not be able to preach well if I'm not healthy. If I'm not healthy, it will affect everything else I do. I must get good sleep. If, if I'm tired, I can't be 100% of my duties. I must take care of myself mentally. I must take care of myself mentally. This is why I read so much. It gives me joy. I, I can't, um, I, 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 it gives me joy. I, I, I want to expand my knowledge. I'm usually I'm constantly listening to um, an audio book or a podcast, just trying to expand my knowledge because I want to learn, because I've got to take care of myself mentally. But beyond that, I must keep my own heart and mind in check. So one thing I do, I've actually got to schedule it this week. Once a year, I meet with a counselor. I mean, I do that the same reason that I go meet with my doctor in March for a physical checkup. I do this for a spiritual checkup. I meet with a counselor, and I just say, hey, ask me some questions and help me figure out where I need to improve for the next year. And he does that. Um, I want to get ahead of any problems I have before they are too bad. I must rest. So I take every Friday off unless there's some emergency. I don't do anything related to pastoring that day unless somebody dies or somebody goes in the hospital. I spend that time with my family, I exercise, I read, I watch a movie, uh, I go for a walk in the neighborhood, I go kayaking at my mother-in-law's house, I just enjoy myself and I relax. I must acknowledge that I can't go on forever never resting. God instituted a day of rest for a reason. I must maintain a healthy family dynamic. 
I must maintain a healthy marriage. I must regularly spend time with my wife. I must take her on dates. I must travel with her. I must do things she wants to do. I must cook her dinner from time to time. I must help her around the house. I, I, I can always be hired by another church. I only get one wife. And so if I fail her, I've failed everything. I must be a good father. I must not neglect my son and hopefully future children. I must be there and be present. I must not, uh, I must not see Haddon as an annoyance. I must not just pass him off to Adrian or grandparents so I can do stuff. If my son grows up to hate the church because I had no relationship with him as his father, I have failed miserably. Look back at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Actually, yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says this about pastors. If he does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? I want to say thank you to y'all. Thank you. You're not a church that expects me to neglect my family to pastor here. I've never felt that. That doesn't mean I don't work hard, and that doesn't mean I don't put in the hours, but I don't feel like I have to neglect my family, and, and they don't feel like that either um, b- b- because you allow me to be flexible there. You don't expect me to neglect them um, for, for you know, overwork like a lot of pastors do. So be sober-minded. Pray that for me. So many of the things I just told you, that I'll be clear-headed. Secondly, endure suffering. The preacher must persevere when backlash comes must persevere when backlash comes. The fact is, preaching is going to confront people. It's going to confront. And people are going to be upset by what is said. They're upset at the king's word in that case, not ultimately at the messenger. But there are going to be times when I preach faithfully and people get mad. It's my job to keep preaching faithfully when that happens. To not back down from truth because somebody responded badly to it. Pray for me in that because I hate conflict. I hate conflict. You know, they talk about how in conflict there's, there's three responses. There's fight, there's flight, and there's freeze. You either go at it with them, you freeze and you don't know what to do, or you get out of there. I'm one of the last two. That's what I do in conflict. I freeze and don't know what to say, or I run. So pray for me that I have the boldness to face conflict and backlash when it comes. Thirdly, do the work of an evangelist. Um, the text says, do the work of, of an evangelist. If you read it in Greek, it's, it's more like um, be a gospelizer, but that'd be weird to say, be a gospelizer. Make the gospel apparent in everything. It's not so much, you know, travel around and do tent revivals. Tent revivals weren't a thing when Paul was writing this. It, it's, it's make sure the gospel is known in everything you do. So I must make the gospel central in my, preach, in my preaching, when I counsel, when I witness, when I visit, when I lead the deacons meeting, when I lead a prayer meeting, when I lead church conference. Everything I do must make the gospel known and make it central. And finally, fulfill your ministry. That's the fourth thing. Fulfill your ministry. The, the preacher must be himself. Must be himself. It's very important that a preacher recognizes who he is and stay in line with that. Because if he tries to be somebody else, he'll just make himself look ridiculous. When we were traveling up to Kentucky, we stopped at several gas stations. And I love the candy aisle. It's one of my weaknesses, especially the colorful, sugary candy. And I'm walking through the aisle one while we're up there. And I look and I see Skittle gummies? Skittle gummies, they're a thing now. They're, at, they're in every gas station. I love Skittles, like the regular Skittles, but these are Skittle gummies, like gummies with the Skittle logo on them. And I looked at them and I thought, those aren't Skittles. Those are gummy bears with, with Skittles logos on them. Skittles, just be who you are. You made a great product, now stick with it and keep it going. You don't have to try and be something that you're not. And that's what happens to a lot of young guys when they become a preacher they find a preacher they really like and they try to be like him i did it when i was first preaching um uh, uh, the, so their their sermons sound just like that person um so i did this early on with with a preacher named john piper you may not know who he is he's been preaching for like 50 years um so what john piper does is he comes up to the pulpit and he holds his arms out and he says let's pray lord we praise you for this and that and, and he's just holding his arms out and i would do that when i preached and he preaches a lot about suffering and a lot about the glory of God and, and all these different things. Like my first 10 sermons sound just like him until a friend of mine finally told me, stop be, trying to be John Piper. 
My sermons were less sermons and more John Piper impersonations, and a lot of guys do this. My job as a pastor, as a preacher, is to be myself. God has gifted me and created me to be Aaron Frazier as a pastor, not somebody else. My job is not to preach like John Piper. It's not to preach like Matt Chandler or Tim Harris, my mentor. If God needed another John Piper, he would have made another John Piper. He didn't. He made me. He made me who I am. My job is to pastor this church like Aaron Frazier, not like all the other people that I follow, not like John MacArthur, not like Mark Dever, not even like Larry Layfield or like any other pastor you've ever had. No, God made each of us unique and made us to be who we are, and if I were to try to be somebody else, that should be a really bad impersonation of those people, and it would, it would be insulting to them and just make me look like a fool. My job is not to pastor another church either. It's not to pastor my church in Louisville, Ninth and O Baptist Church, wonderful church, but, but it's a different church than here. It's not to pastor the church I was ordained at, Woodburn Baptist Church, wonderful church. It's not this church. My job is to pastor this church. This is my ministry. I'm to fulfill my ministry, not somebody else's. So fulfill your ministry. Pray those four things for me, that I'll be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill my ministry because this task of preaching is so important. It is a noble calling that I do not take lightly. So would you pray those things for me regularly and that I would remain faithful to this task. This is the most important thing we do as a church. We proclaim God's word. We, are, we announce his word to people. Not just from the pulpit. You do that with people next to you in life. You're to announce his word. You're to be his messenger. I preach the word here. Your job is to do it in the lives of the people that you know. Church is coming together. It's getting marching orders from the king, and it's going to battle. I remind you of the mantra I live by as a preacher. If you preach it, they will come. So in season and out of season, may we always be a church that preaches the word. Let's pray. Father, I praise you for the word, and I praise you for this great task you've given uh, me and, and many others to preach it. Lord, from this pulpit, Lord, you've given us all the task to preach it to the people in our lives. And Lord, that's not going to be through um, standing up to our neighbors and, and, and giving them an introduction and three points and a conclusion and calling for an invitation, but it's just going to be through speaking a good word for Jesus to them. And so, Lord, help me. Help me preach the word faithfully in season and out of season. Help me to um, be clear-headed, to um, endure suffering, to fill the gospel in everything that I do, and to, and to be myself. And Lord, I pray that every Sunday as I preach and as whoever's in this pulpit preaches, Larry or Matthew or, or anybody else that is here, Lord, I pray that, they, that we would all do so knowing that this is a holy calling and that we are equipping soldiers to go to battle and I pray for those soldiers as they go to battle, and I pray that they would be faithful as well, in season and out of season, that they would preach the word to people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.